Hello, and welcome to this, my first attempt at a narrated PowerPoint presentation. In this presentation, I'll guide you through the various steps I took to restore a very rare Italian monastic lantern clock with a six hour dial. The clock was made early in the 18th century, almost certainly in the Papal States of Italy. At that time, there were many independent states kingdoms, duchies, annexures and border changes up until 1861 when Italy was finally unified. Before the introduction of the 12 hour dial clock in Italy in the 1750s, clocks used the Roman system known as Alla Romana and this clock is a good example. The Roman system began the day at the evening Ave Maria prayers which was at the end of twilight, about half an hour after sunset. The following 24 hours were then divided into four cycles of six hours each. This system was based on the monastic tradition of dividing the day according to canonical prayer times. The picture on this page is of the Quirinal Palace in Rome. It was built in 1583 and has been the home to 30 popes four kings and 12 presidents. And what a beautiful dial. This page shows my eBay purchase. It was offered initially as just the dial chapter ring. And I'd been long trying to acquire one of these rare clocks complete, but I'd been beaten out of auctions twice before. And when this dial came up for sale, I resigned myself to the fact that I may have to make a complete replica with just this dial being the only original part. Then something amazing happened because during my communications with the vendor in Leicester, England, and while the auction was in progress, he found more and more parts as he cleaned out his shed. And by the time the auction had ended, he had found the entire case, the original bell and the original hand that really inspired me to make an unbeatable bid for the dial chapter ring. And then I negotiated with the vendor for all the other parts. Four corner posts, top and bottom brass plates, four finials, four feet, original bell and post, original single hand, original dial plate and the silver chapter ring. What a fantastic flat pack kit for the reconstruction of a rare clock. Do you think I was happy? Happy didn't last long. The shipping of the kit was a disaster. It was sent by parcel post and it passed through five carriers on its way from the UK. With almost no international flights, the parcel eventually reached Australia only to be returned to the sender in the UK because there were no domestic flights in Australia. It did get back safely to the sender and then I chose carrier DHL for another go because they're fully represented in most countries and that means the parcel is in the hands of one agency all the way. And DHL also have their own aircraft and have contracted airlines to do their carrying for them. And while all this was going on, I was keen to get a feel for the real size of the clock. So knowing the chapter ring diameter, I took the kit picture and cropped out each component and then sized it in proportion to the dial and printed it out. The printed components were then glued to cardboard, cut out and assembled into the 3D replica that you can see in front of you. As with all my restorations of early lantern clocks, I use as much contemporary metal, wheels, pinions and parts as possible. And these can come from old clock movements. Even old cast brass serving trays are good for movement plates and parts. Rusty old iron is also good for making parts. From the cardboard replica I'd made, I was able to determine the optimum length for the pendulum. 
Then from the pendulum length, a suitable wheel count for the movement was determined. And from my box of old wheels and pinions recovered from old clock movements, I selected a set of wheels as shown here. Happy days are back. The parcel arrived and I quickly assembled all the parts to see what I had bought. The movement of a lantern clock is unique in that the time and the striking train are horizontally perpendicular to the dial, with the striking train behind the going train. This layout requires narrow vertical movement plates running from top to bottom. Using an old long case clock movement, I cut out three plates to fit into the locating holes in the top and bottom horizontal plates of my frame. With the vertical plates in place, I fitted the dial plate and marked the position through the handhole onto the front vertical plate for the hour wheel stud. You can see the stud and the refurbished hour wheel fitted to the front plate. The biggest wheel in the going train is the great wheel, which carries the rope drive wheel, the click work, and at the front end, a squared on pinion known as the pinion of report. The old wheel I'd selected was remounted onto a new arbor with provision for the rope wheel drive. The hand setting on Italian clocks is achieved by having a tension spring at the great wheel. The large domed iron slotted tension spring transfers the drive from the great wheel to the hour wheel and the hand while allowing for the arbor to turn for hand setting. I used a depthing tool to find the position for the pinion of report to mesh correctly to the hour wheel and then I fitted the great wheel into the plates. To prevent the hour wheel from moving forward on its stud and disengaging from the pinion of report, I made and fitted a boat spring between the wheel and the dial plate. The spring is made from very light gauge brass sheet and it's hammered up into an arc to provide light pressure on the hour wheel and keep it engaged with the pinion. With the great wheel installed, it was full steam ahead, preparing each subsequent pinion and wheel, then depthing them into the plates. Behind the dial plate, you can see the boat spring and the hour wheel. In went the first wheel, then the contrate wheel. To carry the vertical escape wheel arbor, I made and fitted a potence. And this is a small brass block riveted into the middle plate with a pivot hole and a wear plate for the bottom pivot of the vertical arbor. The vertical arbor extended up through the top horizontal plate. Using old iron plate, I've made a top cock for the pivot of the escape wheel arbor and the escape wheel. Now this escape wheel is not new material. It's made from an old spoked wheel with the teeth removed and then using a piece of brass tube from another old pipe, I've soldered on a small section of tube and then cut the teeth into that. Now the horizontal pallet arbor could be installed. And I made and fitted the brass post for the front pivot and using old iron plate, a swan neck cock for the rear pivot. The specifications for a virgin crown wheel recoil escapement required that the escape wheel had an odd number of teeth so that the pallets operated with half a tooth clearance across the escape wheel. Also, the horizontal pallet arbor must pass directly over the top of the pivot of the escape wheel. And also, the active faces of the pallets must be on the center line of the horizontal pallet arbor. To get the active faces of the pallets on the center line, I filed dovetail slots into the arbor, then tapped in dovetailed pallets. And the pallets were then depthed into the escape wheel 
and sold it into their final position. Now you see the completed going train, the pendulum and the bob. So it's time to get some power into this clock. As with all these old war clocks, power comes from a falling weight suspended from rope. So a spike rope wheel is used with cheeks to guide the rope around the wheel. The drive is transferred to the great wheel by a ratchet known as a click attached to the rope wheel cheek which engages with a spoke on the great wheel. By pulling down on a rope in reverse the weight is lifted and the click re-engages when pulling stops and the drive to the going train resumes. These are two small videos, the one on the left showing you the back quarter of the clock operating. Just click on the movie button to make it perform and the same with the right hand side which is a view from the front. These are only short movies but give you a feeling for how the clock actually runs. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation there are very few six hour dialed Italian lantern clocks available. Most would be in, in museums and more than likely most in Italy. The picture on the right is taken from a reference book and it shows you the simplicity of these monastic six hour dials and the clocks. Mine on the left is obviously very, very similar to the one on the right and very, very typical of the style and design of these unique clocks. Unlike English and French lantern clocks of the period, Italian clocks never used wall hooks or spikes to suspend their clocks directly onto the wall. They used a bracket. So, as with my other Italian clocks, I've made a bracket. This time of a very simple design using old oak. Compare the very basic Italian monastic clock on the right to that of the highly decorative Italian lantern clock on the left. They are of the same period, but obviously the one on the left is going to be more expensive and only affordable by the upper class noblemen of Italian society of that period. But notice also how easy it is to read the dial to a quite an accurate time on the little monastic clock. And that's very important for a monastery where prayers have to be called at specific times of the day. That ends this presentation at the completion of the going or time train of the lantern clock. The next stage will be the construction of the more complicated striking train with the associated detents, cams and levers and the hammer and all the parts that link the striking train to the time train. Thanks for watching my presentation. I hope it will inspire you to get in and repair or restore a clock or watch for your choosing. Thank you again.